Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 29th of November, 2012, and Jim Groom is our special guest. Welcome, Jim. Thank you for having me, Steve. I appreciate that. Really excited that you're here. Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for their support. I'm on my Hack Your Education tour, and I'm in LA right now. Tomorrow night, we're meeting at a very posh place, thanks to Ernie Delgado, to have a conversation on education. It's a lot of fun. Go to hackyoureducation.com. One more city to go, which is Phoenix, next week. I think Peggy George is in the audience, and big thanks to Peggy for help there. This has been wonderfully enlightening. Can't wait to talk about it more, but we'll skip that for now. The recordings are up for the last three worldwide virtual conferences, Learning 2.0, Library 2.012, and the Global Education Conference. I think in combination there, there are probably over six or 700 sessions and keynotes, all recorded, all free, lots of fun. Coming up, this is kind of exciting, uh, in March, we've just announced the School Leadership Summit. TCAL is going to be the founding sponsor for that event. It's going to be on March 28th, and uh, we'll, we'll post more information. Uh, HP is sponsoring a worldwide STEM conference called STEM XCon that we'll be holding in April. The Reform Symposium uh, I'm going to be involved in this year, and that's in May. And then we're announcing a Worldwide Homeschooling Conference, which should just be a blast. I'm really excited about each of these events and hope you'll join us. They will all be free, as usual, and they're lots of fun if you haven't attended one yet. Coming up on the Future of Education, uh, next week, Ray McNulty talks to us about his book, It's Not Us Against Them. Uh, the 12th will be the EduBlog Awards, uh, which I co-host with Sue Waters uh, from Australia. On the 13th, Cal Newport comes on to talk about his new book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Cal's going to make the case that the conversation around passion is misguided. I love Cal and can't wait to have that conversation. Adam Fry from Wikispaces comes on on the 18th to talk about um, a pretty significant piece he's about to publish on edtech entrepreneurism and can't wait to talk to him about that. He's uh, very smart guy, and I really like the way he's approached, that, that his company has approached being an entrepreneur in the education environment. David Risher from World Reader comes on on the 28th, I'm sorry, on the 8th of January. On the 29th, we're finally going to dive into Edwards Deming. Gary Obermeyer and I are going to talk about um, Deming, virtual communities, and self-organizing schools. Also committed but not scheduled yet, uh, John Hattie, Elliot Washer, and Michael Fullen. So lots of fun. So glad that uh, that these keep being interesting. If you've missed any of the sessions, they are all recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate format and MP3. Charles Hayes came on. That was an interesting interview. Really like Charles. His book, September University, about self-learning and the responsibility of older citizens to stay learning and to be particularly vocal about that learning. Uh, Kieran Bersetti from India. Uh, from Riverside School in a sort of special recorded only version. I did not do it live with a live audience because of the timing difference. But that's now up on my blog and at futureofeducation.com as well. Um, almost an hour with her. Just a delightful view of letting students take charge and some of the really incredible ways that they're sort of honoring the agency of youth. Tony Jackson and Veronica. Talk to us about um, international education, global education, Yale yeah, Wishnick. Lots, anyway, lots of fun, all recorded. I could talk about all of them at length, but please do consider listening to them if they're of interest to you. So this is when those of you who are here in our live studio audience can tell us where you're participating from. To the left of the map, you'll see some icons. Look for the star and double click on it and then click on the map. I'm in La Cunada Flint Ridge of course, which is not home for me, but it's lovely to be here, even with rainy weather. Feel free to post in the chat maybe your location, time, temperature, Alaska, Canada, New Zealand. I know there are others somewhere in Central America. Where is that? I'd love to know. 
Guatemala. Wonderful. Glad to have you here. Feel free to keep posting those while we move on. There is a Mighty Bell space for tonight's show. Mighty Bell is a new project by Gina Bianchini. I am a paid consultant for Mighty Bell. Uh, Gina's previous project was Ning, and I did work for Ning as well. So you need to know that in full disclosure. But I really like Mighty Bell. It's a curation and conversation piece. And I put a number of links for uh, Jim's work in a Mighty Bell space where you can talk about it and post other information as well. There's the link to the Mighty Bell space. Hope you enjoy that. Jim, you ready? Born ready. <laughs> okay. I have heard great things about you from Audrey Waters forever. And watched the interview that David Wiley did with you for his open course. And I, I'm, I felt like there was maybe a little bit of a disconnect. Did I read too much into that? Um, David had, was sort of pushing for entrepreneurship as the answer to a lot of the issues that came up. And I felt like you were saying it's more about not, not getting caught in an institutional trap. Uh, did I oversimplify in my own mind? Um, no, I don't think you oversimplified in, to the degree that I'm a little bit uh, wary of the entrepreneur, like you said, like wary of the whole passion argument. I'm a little uh, wary of the social entrepreneur argument that's going on the web right now uh, that basically says, you know, the institutions have it wrong, you know, public education, the public infrastructure is not doing it right, it's all bureaucratic, it's not, you know, I actually take a certain amount of pride of working for a public institution and kind of um, framing uh, the work we do here at Mary Washington is part and parcel of the public trust. So not that I don't, you know, like the whole entrepreneurial argument, I think it's a little trumped up, especially when we think about what happened in 2008 with our kind of market-driven system and the beauty of the market. Uh, it's not always right. But also, I kind of feel better when the whole idea of making money and turning it into a product isn't the first thing we think about. Like, let's think about the experimentation and the innovation. And I understand people are going to make money on it and turn it into products to some degree. I just personally don't feel like that is a part of the conversation I'm as interested in. I do think it's an important part of the conversation, just for me. It's not what gets me excited. Well, we're here to talk about what gets you excited, so that's good. Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what gets me excited, Steve, I'm, if you give me a second. Yes, go. What gets me excited? That you have some kind of global web that my cousin, Jackie Galanti, wrote me an email and said, hey, I hear you're going to be on Steve Har Hargadon today. And she was all excited about it. And so was I that she actually uh, emailed me. So thanks for helping me reconnect with my cousin, Jackie Galanti. And Jackie, if you're listening, you will. So that's a first, but I'm delighted that that was the case. In fact, I'm staying at the home of some friends here in Los Angeles as part of my Pack Your Education tour. And one of the people who was part of the organizing committee for here in LA asked me where I was staying and I mentioned it and she knew them quite well. And I thought, this is intriguing how the world is both big and small at the same time. Yeah, so yeah, I thought that was awesome. So thank you, Steve, for not only inviting me, but actually for uh, me and my cousin Jackie are going to have a lot to talk about after this. <laughs> I want to take too much credit. Okay, so I've been searching for a name for uh, for something for quite a while. And I do these workshops at conferences often with a woman named Alice Keeler. And we've used the phrase a personal web presence and a digital profile. And I read about a domain of one's own, and I just nearly fell over. I was so jealous that you had kind of nailed it. <laughs> so I'm going to bring the website up right now. And I wonder if you would talk to us a little bit about this. Absolutely. Um, so what is the domain of one's own? Um, for me, I don't know if you get the reference, but it's actually a literary reference. The reference is to um, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. And trying not to do too much discredit to Virginia Woolf, um, we really thought that 
for us, the conversation around all of this has more to do with independence and personal ownership than kind of, you know, turning it into a product or a commodification of the process or of the web. So the domain of one's own kind of made sense as a terminology because the idea behind what we were doing was bringing a framework to our work where we asked and invited people to control the work they do. So rather than working through these third-party systems, but getting their own domain space, getting their own kind of um, web server, and getting their domain, jimgroom.com or whatever that might be, and experimenting with it and building on it. And that's kind of how we've approached it. And domain of one's own really does come out of the Jenny Wolf's notion of, you know, for women to be writing, and she's writing this in the 1920s and 30s, to be writing alongside men, you know, with the same amount of freedom and kind of independence, they need certain things. They need a room of their own. They need financial independence, you know, and they need a kind of a concept of themselves as not part and parcel of this kind of larger framework of the masculine society, but also this kind of independence of. And I think, I frankly think that, you know, no discredit to Jenny Wolf, her concepts are far bigger and more important than the domain of one's own, but it's a spark to think about what it means as individuals for us to kind of maintain and control our data and our identities online that isn't always mediated through third-party corporate entities. And that doesn't mean it can't be, and there isn't convenience to that fact, but I'm far more interested in the fact that we're often on a web now that makes the process of controlling and maintaining your digital identity so much simpler and so much more powerful and um, also allows you to kind of control the message of who you are, but also maintain that data. And there's all sorts of legal and kind of personal reasons to do that, but there's also just a kind of sense of, you know, also owning your space online and experimenting with it and making something beautiful of it. So that's kind of an idea we've been playing with here at Mary Washington since 2008. And what's great is it's actually now articulating itself as a culture wide phenomenon that faculty and students alike are becoming part of. So we're actually giving faculty and students their own domain space and their own web hosting and asking them to experiment and build their digital identity from scratch. And it's we're working with them, we're giving them money to do it. It's a it's a really exciting time to be part of uh, the web at University of Mary Washington. So I wonder if your experiences are mirroring the mine. So I do this as sort of the, the core activity on the Hacker Education uh, All Day event. And people are very comfortable, educators are very comfortable with the idea that students need some kind of digital representation or an ability to manage their own uh, image online. The moment I mention the value of them both modeling that and learning how to do it, there's actually some fear I can sense. And then once we do it, it's almost like there's an emotional release. People are so, they're kind of giddy and excited once they've done it, once they finally kind of put themselves online. Do you see the same pattern at all? You know, so we're pretty early into the pilot. So we, we started the pilot in fall. But the pilot didn't kind of come of Zeus's head, right, like Athena. But we've been developing this here as part of a kind of cultural shift since about 2006 or 2007. Um, we started an a enterprise-wide blogging system called UMW Blogs um, at Mary Washington in the fall of 2007. And we did see that excitement that you're talking about, Steve, uh, very clearly when we first gave people their own blogs. And this was kind of night and day from Blackboard. Like, they had Blackboard, which is just like fluorescent lighted, you know, space. Like, you're in a waiting room at some sort of dental appointment versus having a blog where you can kind of frame the header or control the theme or, you know, integrate new media seamlessly and it also be open and available. And I think that excitement of being able to do that on a blogging platform, say like WordPress or Drupal or what have you, was really exciting not only in 2007, but yes, I agree, you take that now where I think faculty and students alike are realizing, hey, oh wow, I can actually install this and manage it myself. And then also say I can link it to a domain space that comes with me no matter where I am. And that's very important when you think about a student who, yes, they'll be at your school for four years maybe, but what happens after that? How do they take all the work they've done with them seamlessly? And, you know, that's a real big question for us at Mary Washington. So 
not only did we experiment with that with UMW blogs, but a number of us here, uh, Alan Levine, Martha Burtis, myself, Michael Branson-Smith at CUNY, uh, Scott Lowe at um, the Temple University of Tokyo started teaching a class called Digital Storytelling or DS106 back in 2010 or 11. And part of that class was actually asking students, and Jim Stouffer, who's in the uh, chat, hi Jim, actually experimented along with us in this. And we asked students to get their own domain and web host and build their own space and use that as a portfolio where they created their digital story. And it was really remarkable to see, A, how much easier it is than it was maybe five or six years ago. And then B, like you said, the excitement and almost giddiness of people owning and maintaining their own little bit of you know, real estate on the web. And that notion of how that connects to also who they are on the web and controlling their sense of identity. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm, it's a long-winded response to say yes, that giddiness still comes. And it comes, I think in some ways, with a sense of, wow, not only is it exciting and fun, but it's far easier than I ever thought. And I think that's why Domain of One's Own can happen at Mary Washington right now, is that the technology is at a point where, you know, we can actually make this thing happen on a scale of giving it to a thousand freshmen come fall 2013. And uh, that's kind of an exciting thing to think about, you know, if this is about the future of education, like, might it be a point in the future where we're giving students their own web host and domain and we're syndicating their work into a kind of IT infrastructure that looks nothing like what we have right now. You know, with a lot of guests, I worry about going in the direction I'm about to go. But with you, I'm not nervous about it. So sort of intriguingly, it feels as though there are a lot of financial interests in education for whom that kind of independence and portability don't result in sort of known profit, and so it doesn't get promoted. Do you see a connection between the difficulty of making independence profitable and the, the ways in which uh, you know a lot of large educational organizations aren't necessarily going to promote the kind of independence and portability you're discussing? Yeah, I mean, the question of profit is a good one. And, I mean, one of the reasons I like to work in higher ed and I've been lucky to work in higher ed for as long as I have is that I'm kind of a little bit, I mean, education is a business. I'm not pretending it's not, but at least with the work I've done, the work I've been done hasn't been directly tied to a profit. Like, you know, how profitable is your work? And I think the, the thing is, when I think about that, is the independence of, you know, students, particularly faculty, is that their ability to build these spaces and manage these spaces has everything to do with part of their education in the 21st century. You know, has everything to do with us preparing um, scholars and scholars to be to think critically about the medium through which we're producing and creating uh, information. And I think I want to think about at the baseline as an educator or as part of an educational institution, my mission is still that to kind of hold up a uh, framework whereby the medium is also helping us understand itself. Like, we're putting them within the medium. We're not talking about Twitter in front of a blackboard. Like, this is what you would do on Twitter, theoretically. No, you're doing it on Twitter, or you're doing it in the space that you're talking about. And that Marshall McLuhan vision that seemed crazy in the 60s is here. And part of what an educational institution should be doing is you know, working within and trying to understand the medium that is defining the culture at that moment. So I like to think of the work we're doing, you know, at educational institutions more generally as really the avant-garde of understanding the media through which we're communicating right now. And I think domain of one's own is far more important as a kind of conceptual understanding of the media we exist within, namely the web than it is a kind of particular promotion of giving, you know, a thousand students a domain and web host. I think that's important, but it's far more important as a conceptual understanding of where we are in the information ecosystem that's defining us as a culture. And like Wikipedia or what have you, like the social construction of knowledge is everywhere apparent. 
and I want to kind of embark in that space. And I, I understand there'll be profit margins to consider in, you know, the web. But I think almost the web has become, for the last 20 years, far more interested in, you know, how do we really monetize it rather than how do we create art on it or how do we understand its form or how do we make it beautiful or how do we use it to share extensively the knowledge that before was seemed impossible, you know? I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know if it's the moment of late capitalism in the 20th century, the quote, you know, uh, uh, forgetting his name, um, Frederick Jameson, or if it's that everything kind of turns back to this notion of, you know, yeah, it's fine and good, but how are we going to profit on it? And uh, I think that will happen, and it has happened, you know. You know, people have figured that out, Amazon and YouTube maybe. I don't know if they're making a profit, but I'm far more interested part of the educational sphere of, like, how we can use it to transform the process of sharing, understanding, and building uh, a culture that, understands how media technology creates information in the 21st century. And I think if we don't pay attention to that very closely, you know, we're at risk of, you know, not really understanding, you know, where we're going. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's overstated. I don't think it's overstated. And, and I would even say that I think in some ways you're maybe attributing more awareness than exists generally. There's a, there is a deeper connection here for me, which is part of the reason I was so excited to, to interview you, which is our vision of education. There's a stark contrast between um, getting people to get degrees in order to compete with China and yeah. helping people understand uh, the, a process and their own intellectual growth and the, the sharing and that social construction of knowledge, it feels to me as though that's actually a pretty um, significant difference in vision. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Steve. I think it's a good point you make. And one of the things that's interesting that I've learned over the last year or two you know, and I've been blogging for seven years, and it's it's becoming a it's kind of a very kind of useful and enjoyable obsession. And so, I love to do it. I love to share the things I'm thinking about or learning about. And you know, it's just become a natural part of who I am and how I go about my business. And you know, when we went to a class and started teaching these classes like DS106 and Martha Burtis and Al Levine were particularly you know very helpful in this. It's like we started thinking about, like, what is it we do when we're online and what is it that this space affords us? And it really affords us a way to kind of narrate our process of learning. And when you have this peer-to-peer -peer sense of learning where by narrating your thinking and narrating how you figured something out and throwing it out there, you know, not only will that potentially help you fix a washing machine, but it might help you understand the finer points of Nietzsche or it might help you conceptualize, like, the power of black exploitation film in the 70s or the revisionist history of James Elroy's The Black Dahlia. Like, the points of understanding and light on the web are amazing in terms of their multiplicity. And I think when you come to a university with a project like The Man of One's Own, it has to be with that in mind. Like, we're going to give each of our students and faculty the ability to narrate their thinking and their work with the hope that we'll bring a community online in the sense of, you know, sharing a constellation of thought. And Gardner Campbell always said this, and I really love this idea. It's like it's in a way to kind of, you know, map and lay bare the thinking of a community, right, online. Like it's a way to really kind of frame what has before happened, but usually in some sort of isolation of a class or in a hallway. And I'm not saying that was any less powerful, but what does it mean when you can augment it by just opening it up for other people to do it? And I think that other part of this is really what's important is I'm very into the web and all it affords, but I'm also very into a concept of openness, and that can happen with or without the web, obviously. But when you, I think, marry the web and its possibilities with the notion of being open and sharing freely, you know, you start having utopian visions. Now, obviously, you're going to have to, 
you know, check some of those utility invasions at the door, depending upon, you know, the copyright law in, in, in place in your country. But um, there's, you know, I, I still am very much an idealist about that kind of stuff. I think, you know, I, I always go back to that, I don't know, Ang Lee's Hulk, which a lot of people didn't like. I did like Ang Lee's Hulk for some reason. And I always loved it when, you know, Bruce Banner and that one said, what we do here is the basic science. Like, I want to think that's what we're still doing at the university. Like, we're doing the basic fundamental thinking around what this space is and how we explore it and experiment with it. And if we're not doing that, then the kind of counterpart of Bruce Banner and that Hulk is the guy who just wants to monetize it right away and not even think about what it is and could care less how it infects or affects a culture. Or uh, And I, I think that's what I've always struggled with. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like a, as a culture, we're, we're almost so obsessed with this metric analytic, you know, um, money-related vision of what we're producing in, in universities and colleges more generally. And I'm not sure it's, it's going to help anyone. I'm not sure there's going to be a benefit there. You know, but I don't know. I'm not an economist. But it seems like uh, we have this obsession. And, you know, I'm not going to try and paint this rosy picture of what universities always have been. We've always been in the cutting edge of, you know, the web was kind of defined at a university, was created at a university, and Google was too, right, as, as part of the university. But you know, universities are also conservative, you know. Um, but I want to think that conservative or not, uh, there's still a kind of protected space, and protected is a dangerous space, because soon I'll be saying sacred space, which I don't think it is sacred. And I think the more the web w kind of creeps into our life and defines it, the less sacred this idea of a university should be. I think the more the web becomes part and parcel of who we are and how we learn and how we share, the less and less sacred the idea of university should be. It shouldn't necessarily go away. But it shouldn't be this privileged space that you pay fifty thousand dollars a year to enjoy. So, Jim, with your optimist hat still on, uh, help frame for me or for the audience what's happened with MOOCs, because I I'm very tempted to put my pessimist hat on when it comes to you know, the university adoption of MOOCs, moving from the sort of connectivist cons constructivist MOOC to now the what we're calling the X MOOC which really seems to have lost the, the roots of that transparency you're describing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the old MOOC question, right? The first thing about MOOCs is, you know, hats off to, you know, Wiley, Cormier, Siemens, and um, uh, Chorus, uh, Chorus um, all the folks who got that concept going back in 2000, 2008, not knowing that it would take over the world. <laughs> right? I mean, I am just blown away by the the kind of uh, the hype around MOOCs still. And uh, I think, you know, the, I think the massive, the massive vision of it is overstated. I think the idea that, you know, a massive course is necessarily um, some sort of greater course is overstated. Not that I don't think the web itself doesn't afford certain augmentation. I mean, it would go against what I'm very arguing, right? I mean, I think the web by its nature kind of augments one blog post so that maybe 10,000 people read it, and that's crazy, right? But the MOOC, as I'm seeing it in Coursera and other spaces for me, and, you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with them. I'm just not very excited by them in the same way. I, I think they kind of reproduce a lot of the worst instructional design we've seen over the last 20 years. But the thing about the MOOC that really kind of strikes me is how unweb like it is how monolithic it is. Like, it's like 190,000 people in a class using a streamlined LMS, and we're going to watch video. It's like, really? That's not only alienating and scary, but the whole vision of the web that I thought was amazing is that it took those 190,000 people and it scaled it beautifully so that you could find the five of them who were interested in, you know, Mario Bava Italian horror films just like you. And you could kind of connect around that. And I know that the MOOC as it was conceived and the connectionist vision doesn't preclude that. But I think the vision of it now is really about metrics and numbers and analytics and gaining data. It has very little to do with being open. It has everything to do with doing it on other people's servers. 
It has nothing to do with open source or open architecture. It has everything to do with kind of taking these elite universities' brands and turning it into some kind of global, you know, product. It's the, I mean, it's the complete, it's a complete abortion when I think about it, right? It's, it's everything that the web provided us an alternative to. <laughs> and it's kind of reimagined itself as this solution, but it's monolithic. It's, it's so unweb-like. It's like going to a stadium on the web, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to Giant Stadium on the web and root on, you know, these two professors talking about physics. I, I, I just don't understand the mentality of it. But I also understand and I love the vision of an online class that's open and, I mean, to use uh, Alan's idea, Alan Levine's idea, kind of fractal. Like, the, the massiveness is through connections with other people, right? It's the Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation more than, you know, here's my numbers of people and I'm having a class. Aren't I a superstar educator? You know, don't you want to be like me? It seems like it's a, it's kind of a, a silly sense of a star system um, for, I think, a, a space that has probably you know, not, it's always had stars, but it never has had stars on the scale. And rather than those stars at all getting even like, reimbursed for their stardom, it's all going to a third-party system. The crazy thing about MOOCs, and this is all I'll say about them, is when you start talking about a Duke class or a you know, Harvard class or a University of Michigan class as a Coursera class rather than a University of Michigan class, something's wrong. Like, you missed the whole idea of your brand and what you do as an educational institution. Like, you know, part of that identity has been, you know, so freely given away. I often liken it to King Lear, right, and his, with his daughters and Cordelia reminding him, don't give your kingdom away yet, father. You know, you're still here. And I feel like that's the university. It's like, they're just giving away their kingdom, you know, and they have no sense of, you know, who they're giving it to and what that will mean to them. And I, it's kind of a weird moment for education. You know, we, I was excited about that kind of open possibilities. And, you know, it always seems that if it's not packaged for convenience, it's really not interesting to most people. And that's a sad realization, especially like domain of one's own is the complete opposite of a MOOC. It's like we want you to have your own space and be massive in that space to share with whoever you want, you know. It's the MOOC as the web should be, you know, scaling through the individual, not through the course experience. I'm tempted to say, yes, but how do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, appre I'm appreciative of your candor and your straightforwardness. Um, Audrey and I talk about this a lot on our weekly podcast, and I've come to the conclusion that those who capture large amounts of data will see data as being the answer. But if you look at the whole concept of robo-grading, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's all, uh, yeah, and, and again, I feel the same way about outsourcing of your core value as an institution. The moment you're signing up to have your classes be through Coursera, I, it's like watching a, you know, a whole group of universities knowingly walking off the edge of a cliff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I, I mean, and I'm looking at the chat as you're talking, and you know, Pablo brings up points. You know, there's there may be MOOCs that small communities are getting around, you know, and there's, you have these huge communities and then, you know, 10 or 15 people come together and they learn together. Now, I think that's fine. I mean, I don't know how that was different from putting lectures up on the web or on YouTube before. Like, that's what I don't understand the difference of the MOOC is, is that the course structure, because it's not very structured and it's not particularly engaging. I mean, I understand being engaged by the 15 people, but that's not massive. That's what the web should be. It's... I just think the idea is so beautifully packaged and everybody's kind of jumped onto it hook, line, and sinker. And I think, you know, I have to agree to some degree. I have to believe to some degree Siemens and Downs are like, oh, Jesus, what did we do? And maybe they're not, but, you know, their idea has been kind of, I think, bastardized to some degree to be this neat package of a kind of open online course. But their idea is powerful in that, you know, 
it can be. I mean, I think that's part of the power of the idea that people play with it a lot. But it's kind of what we started this conversation around is it's almost like from zero to 60, like a great idea becomes a commodity in no time. And what's interesting about what you said about the robo grader is, is, is that's a way to kind of make that commodity profitable. Right, but the whole question that we haven't even talked about when we talk about MOOCs and massive courses and assessment and all that is, you know, what does that mean for kind of gaming the system of a robo grader? How easy would it be to design an algorithm that would just put in keywords and make no sense and pay someone five dollars or ten dollars or five hundred dollars to take a class for you and get an A because they've hacked that algorithm? I mean. The questions are far and wide, and I don't pretend to be an exp expert on the MOOC, and I've had fun watching it, and I'm a big fan of the development of it as a kind of concept, and I think it's a powerful concept, and I think there's a lot of things to think about there. I don't want to discount it out of hand, but I think, like most things in ed tech, um, there's very little kind of critique around it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of kind of huge bandwagon jumping and people getting excited about it and universities getting scared and universities signing up for it and places like Duke and University of Michigan and places that are, you know, have great professors and a lot of talent who are just kind of giving away their their talent. And it's just weird. I, I, I don't fully understand it. You know, I have opinions about it, obviously, but I'm not going to pretend to fully understand its, its uh its full impact on our culture yet, because we haven't heard the last of it, obviously. You know, I had Stephen Downs and Alec Koros and George Siemens and um, Inga DeVard on, Carol Yeager. They came on to do a show on sort of the, the true roots of the MOOC. And I was it was kind of intriguing because they're not, nobody was really sort of up in arms. I think, it, I'm not even sure I could have described what they expressed as sadness because I wasn't there. I think many of them just sort of thought, well, this is kind of how it happens. You know, unfortunately, this is just sort of what happens. Yeah. I don't, I, and I, maybe that's the case. I mean, I didn't hear that, but I'm definitely not of the mindset that I think we control the destiny of it. And, you know, I am watching the, 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 uh, the commentary in the chat, and it's great, and I love it. And, you know, People are getting in it, and then whenever you talk MOOCs, people get excited. And you know, Jackie Gerstein brings up the idea of cons, and MOOCs have the benefit of getting education to those who would not have access. But it's like, yeah, but the web has been around for 20 years, and it's done that. It's like MOOCs didn't bring education to the wide world. The web did, and it's been doing it for a long time. MOOCs is just a way to package it and to invite corporate America and the corporate and well, global corporate companies into this space and allow them frankly, to ravage it. So, I mean, I, I think you've got to be careful. And if, if Downs and Siemens and Coursera and Coros, who I think are all kind of very thoughtful people, I think they understand there's a balance there, you know. And I think you, you, gotta, you have to understand that, you know, you look at how things have gone once you invite in a kind of a rabid sense of the market. And, uh, you know, it's not, and it's also the question of MOOCs have gotten away from, the question of open architecture, of making it easy for anyone to do. Of build. One of the things I liked about digital storytelling in DS106 is that it was all open source software. Anyone could reproduce that framework if they wanted to, or if they didn't, they didn't have to. But, you know, could you reproduce a Coursera course? I mean, I guess, because it's so simple, and that's what Mike Caulfield's doing in, in Canvas right now. But the idea of the sign up and the massive numbers, you know, it's a celebrity system based on closed proprietary software. Um, that has very little to do with how most professors in higher ed teach. And there's a way to be an awesome, you know, articulated, you know, online, web-based, digital professor without ever doing a MOOC. You know, it's just become, yeah, I don't know. The, there are so many audience who really want us to move on. <laughs> this is a very interesting chat going on. Please leave the MOOCs. Talk about a demand of one's own. One of the things that I experience when talking about uh, a demand of one's own is that there's a somewhat knee-jerk reaction against focusing on self or uh, um, um, even a concern that this sort of looks like branding, personal branding. How do you address that? How have you addressed that? And how do you describe this process of aggregating your own presence without it being egotistical? Yeah. 
You know, we actually had a really, so you kind of catch me at a good time. And thank you, everybody in the chat, for saying move on from the MOOCs. I couldn't agree with you more. But um, we had a really good uh, meeting today. So what we're doing, let me kind of give you a, a framework of what we're doing with the Mangrove Zone. We're in the pilot year of it. We have about 300 uh, faculty and students on it right now. We are actually doing a push for the spring semester where we've invited as many faculty who are interested. We'll give them money and time, and we'll create a kind of a six-week course where they work with the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies, which is our group, and we'll sit down and work with them to think about what does it mean to uh, maintain a digital identity and be on and of the web and share your scholarship and narrate your work. And, you know, the ego thing and the idea that I'm just kind of self-promoting, I mean, sure, that's one way to look at it, but it's not self-promotion when you're in a dialogue about ideas openly on the line and you're sharing stuff. I mean, it's self-promotion if you're kind of like a social media, you know, hey, check out this link to get a new iPad. Yeah, sure, that's, that's you know, marketing and shameless self-promotion. <coughs> or maybe not self-promotion in the same ways of kind of social promotion of, you know, you making money. And self-promotion, you see it, right, you know, and it happens to people, I'm great, look at me. And, you know, people get tired of you if all you talk about is yourself. But the idea that these are scholars and students at a university who have very particular skills, have very particular expertise, and we're giving them a channel to share that openly and to have a space online when people and students are searching for them and they want to know more about their research or who they are, they can find it. <laughs> and we just had this discussion with 30 faculty this afternoon, and it was awesome. They are chopping at the bit to share their work and to take some control of who they are on the line. I mean, I think Mary Washington is set to do some really exciting stuff. And, you know, the social promotion thing, I think those students, I mean, not the social promotion, I'm thinking K-12, um, the idea of, like, self-promotion is kind of, yeah, I heard that a lot back in 2007 and 8 and the personal brand. You know, but that was because the, the, that was the marketing language. Domain of One's Own was very much outside of the marketing language. It was an intellectual, conceptual space that you want to be in as a thinker, you know. And uh, that's, I think, how we framed it. And like everything, the metaphor of how you do this stuff is essential and important. We wanted the metaphor to be, like just with you and Lily Boggs, that this is a space where you do academic work, where you put your best forward, foot forward of who you are as a student or a faculty member. And that's just really um, carrying over to uh, the space of domain of one's own. And that's exciting because I tried to make this point earlier. I'm not sure I did, though. The domain of one's own is born out of work we did with the you and Boggs, with the digital storytelling class, and it's kind of a, a part of a narrative arc that has watched the transformation of a culture. And, you know, we're not overly concerned here with everyone doing it, but we're concerned with the right people doing it for the right reasons. And uh, the people who have real deep problems that this is just kind of uh, empty self-promotion, well, they won't do it. And that's their right, and we respect it. And frankly, it's, it's good that they don't do it if they feel that's all it is. But those who understand that maybe it's a dialogue and conversation or discourse about bigger and more powerful things, well, those are the people we want to work with and kind of frame this discussion around. So, you know, that's the other thing. This is not a mandate. You know, it's, it's an open invitation to experiment. We're getting a lot of interesting questions in the chat. Um, I had a guy on the show named Carl Speak who wrote a book called Be Your Own Brand. And, and Carl was really interesting because he said, he defined a brand as the way you can help others. And in a lot of ways, in, in addition to some of the things that you said, um, aggregating your uh, conversations and, and who you are and what you care about um, sort of uniquely, at least for me, has allowed me to be helpful to others in a way that was very fulfilling personally. I mean, yeah, for me, if I can kind of extract that out for what I do, I mean, that's kind of, I, I like the role of instructional technologist. That's what I am. I identify with it very closely. And maybe the terminology is wrong. I don't know. I'm, you know, I think all terminology is always forward, but the idea is that I am, I have this job at this point in time because of the web, you know, like because universities and businesses and schools and 
you know, everybody is trying to understand how this medium works. And so, yeah, I think what I do with faculty and students alike is I hopefully go through the process with them. And part of that process means being a practitioner in it, it means experimenting with it, it means kind of, you know, being in and out of the web. I couldn't say, hey, you should get your own domain and web host if I hadn't done it and practiced it for years. I mean, that's a very important part of this. And, you know, I don't want to be I want to be part of a, a community that we're working through it together and there's a sense of kind of camaraderie. And I mean, our group is, that's our expertise, is preparing faculty for that, working as partners with them and, you know, having them think about this. So, so like I think Barbara said it, you know, you know, the social web in, is kind of premised, at least in education, on social teaching, which means there's completely different modes of teaching now. Teaching to with an open base, understanding how other people can come in and comment on your students' work, and it doesn't have to be massive. Sometimes two people is massive, and I think that's just uh, simple concepts of asking faculty to think about how they might open up their class or change it or uh, augment it or use their class to build resources for the web so other people can use. <laughs> I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, and. That's what I love about the web. It's like early cinema. I always make that comparison. It's like it, it, it hasn't been defined yet. Its shape is still forming. And part of what I love about what we do in this space is that we're still shaping it. And it, it can't be, we can't shape it by only thinking about ed tech. We can shape it by thinking about all the different interest and cultural things that turn us on and use who we are to help shape it and make it authentic. You know, I think I get, I've been more and less and less interested in the discussion around MOOCs and all that stuff because of that. I feel it's very much you get stuck in a spiral of this space of ed tech and it's kind of this self-fulfilling fulfilling prophecy. I, I'm far more interested in what other people who aren't consumed by the space bring to it. That said, I think ed tech and the space has done some powerful things like, you know, christen this idea of a MOOC and start all that, you know, questions and other things. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the more we bring who we are to this space and understand that what the web allows us is this vernacular of both scholarship, professionalism, and personal relations is a really kind of new dynamic that we have to work with faculty and students alike to think through. And the more faculty understand it, the more they can help and mentor students in this situation to understand what this means, you know. Um, and that has a lot of huge cultural implications. More and more, and I'm sorry, you shut me up whenever you want. More and more, I want to go back and study the cultural implications of the web. Not so much the ed tech, but <laughs> what it means for us as a culture. So, Jim, oh, okay, sorry. Really just interested. So, it's interesting to watch no, the chat okay. because it feels as though there are sort of two discussions going on at very different levels. And um, the one discussion is the way in which a demand of one's own, the concern about MOOCs, and the thinking about what should happen in a university is at this very sort of core philosophical level. And there are a fair number of people in the chat who are asking questions at a much more surface level, like Facebook versus LinkedIn and the like. And I think we're watching sort of two separate conversations take place. I want to bridge them for a moment by, by asking a question that Newman asked some, some minutes ago. He said, why not just use an e-portfolio system? I think that maybe gives an entry into kind of this discussion of why the form matters and how it relates to the deeper topic. Well, I mean, think about e-portfolio, just think about that term. Uh, the term itself, it could mean many things to many people. It could mean, here's my portfolio online. Here's a department's e-portfolio of their students' work. Um, e-portfolio is often kind of associated with personal or departmental assessment. The word itself has kind of lost any meaning. It's like the, <laughs> the, the signified and the signifier have kind of, you know, fallen apart from one another with that term. So, you know, the domain of one's own is not an e-portfolio. I mean, sure, someone could use it as a space to define who they are online, which a good e-portfolio might do, but it's really more of a sandbox in the experimental space that what you do with it, we hope that we hadn't thought about it. You know, the fact is, is why we did this as instructional technologists at UMW in 2006, and we all got our own web space, 2005, 2006, and we experimented with open source tools and installed them, and that notion of experimenting was part of the fun of the 
having it. And it wasn't like, oh, okay, now you use a neat portfolio and you're done. No. You install, you experiment, you blog, you narrate what you learned, and it's a virtuous cycle. And I think that's, to me, um, the e-portfolio is not even really a term I'm interested in anymore. I mean, people respond to it, so sometimes I'll throw it out there, but I think it's pretty much an empty term, and uh, you really have to define what exactly you mean when you say it for it to have any meaning. So we're still getting interesting questions in the chat about what the domain of one's own actually is. So, <laughs> so if you and I were in the elevator and you were describing a domain of one's own, can you give us that pitch for those who are still confused about what you're talking about? Um, I, guess, I mean, yeah, my elevator pitch. I don't, I mean, I really don't have an elevator pitch for, I mean, I've seen some of the commentary like, oh, maybe he's just trying to hate mooks because he's trying to make domain of one's own its own thing. It's like, no, I don't look. I don't hate mooks. You know what I mean? I just think... You know, it just is a good indicator of just how ridiculous people are and how, how, to what lengths they'll go not to think about what it means to control and maintain and manage their identity online for themselves. And, like, to frame their whole notion of who they are through this kind of vision of a technology, which is one of just potentially thousands of ways to imagine a class, is special. <laughs> so, that said... The domain of one's own is that. It's a space where you define and build an identity through yourself. You frame out who you are. You imagine. I can't tell you exactly what it is because hopefully you'll redefine it. That was the beauty of you and the blogs. We didn't tell people how to use it. We built it and said, show us how to use it. And they did. There's no kind of, hopefully the book will be written by people who imagine it. What was the name of one's own for me? It was creating a blog called Baba Tuesday, and it was spending, you know, the better part of the last seven years sharing openly my ideas about what I was learning, how I was teaching, what I was thinking about, the movies I liked, the books I was reading, what was happening with my family. It was an open, authentic process. That's the name of one's own. It's not a canned educational product. You know, it can't be. Okay. <laughs> Jim, I love what you're saying. And I mean, I love that you use the word process and versus a canned product because it feels to me that what really ties all of what you've talked about together here is this sense of the learning process and sharing it with each other such that the, that the scaling is generative, that it's not just filling in a form or putting the right thing in an LMS, but it's teaching each other the process in order to be able to go through the individual learning. Um, am I even close to what you're feeling? Well, I mean, look, Jackie goes to you. Yeah, you have students create something on Weebly. Do they own that? Maybe. They have it, but Weebly can go away. And they Have they learned that much more about the web, about what a website is, what it means to install, what a database is, what kind of some of the kind of nuts and bolts of what a web is. I mean, part of what you should do at a university and you should do as a professor is kind of have people think more critically about the environment within which they teach and learn. And I think that's the main of one's own. It's saying, you know what? Yeah, we could do this on Weebly. Yeah, we could do this on Blogger or WordPress.com or Facebook. Or you could kind of Take a space of your own. Think about what it means to manage and build an online identity of some of your best years of thinking and writing and imagining and own it and take it with you and have that domain space that comes with you as a kind of frame for who you are. I mean, it's, it's strange to me that, like, in 2012, when people are Googling themselves to understand who's saying what about them, that the idea that you can control that... You know, the web doesn't happen to you. In fact, you shape the web. You define the web. The web is something that you are in dialogue with. That's why it's unique as a medium. And if that's not clear as a part of the domain of one's own, I mean, if that's not clear as part of what, what's radical about the web, then, I, I mean, that's the question, that's the whole idea of what Web 2.0 supposedly was about back in 2004, right? Is that we're entering a whole new space of interaction. 
And part of that interaction in a civil society, and if you talk about civil rights and the idea of owning who you are and owning the data, would be teaching students to take control of that. You know, are they going to get subpoenaed for information when it's on someone else's server, like Twitter, Facebook? I mean, what are the, what are the legal ramifications of asking students to do it on a third-party site, right? Well, there's the whole questions there that, you know, we talk about FERPA and all these other things I did. Like, what are, are we not being completely careless by asking our students to put all this stuff in Google, right? Are we giving it all away to an advertising company? You know, it's like domain of one's own for me is like an antidote to the nonsense. That's what it is. That's my elevated pitch. It's an antidote to all the nonsense. So, Jim, I've got to say this is been so fascinating and interesting to watch the chat at the same time. I think that we're very used to asking which tool, what are the steps to follow, how do I introduce it, and I feel like what you're saying is there's something much more important here. There's this sense of independence, control, and value that you can't just sort of package and give to somebody else. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. And I know that there, there's been so much here that I probably have missed in the chat. Um, but I'm going to give people a chance. I mean, let's say we'll take at least one or two questions. You can either raise your hand, and I'll turn the mic on for you, or you can put a question in the chat. And let's see if we can address some of the things that have come up. Um, like Carolyn's asking, do we ultimately pay for a domain of one's own? Uh, my sense is that what Carolyn's thinking about is the actual domain name. And I'm not even sure that's critical to you at this point, is it? Ah, uh, well, I mean, hey. So let me step back because I, I really, I got actually, the the chat has gotten me fired up. So you people in the chat are doing fine work. Um, you know, yeah, sure. You pay for web hosting. You pay for a domain. I pay uh, twelve bucks for Baba Tuesdays a year, and you know, 30 bucks now for web hosting a month. I mean, that's space I pay, I invest in. That's part of who I am. And questions, larger questions about the domain of one's own is what do I do with that stuff when I die? Like, is that an archive I take with me? Like, there's larger 21st century questions about archiving this space that people like John Udell are dealing with in really brilliant ways that I haven't even mentioned, but that's a part of this in some ways. It's a part of articulating this. And, you know, a domain of one's own should go well beyond education. You should have a domain of one's own for your electric bill. You should have a space where you can see that data and own it. You should have a space where you can own your um, dental records, your medical records, your, um, you name it, your police records. Like, all that stuff should be yours. You know, it should be part of a kind of, I think, some sort of federal or national space that's protected for you. That's a kind of digital token of all the things you've done, and you decide how you share it where it lives. I mean, the demand of one's own on the scale of UMW is kind of, hey, this is a little higher ed educational project. But people like John Udell have been thinking about this as a much bigger, more fascinating concept of we're moving into an age where our data and our stuff is digital and how we maintain it and own it as a part of our personal archives. You know, is Facebook the best option for a personal archive or YouTube? I've learned very hard the hard way that YouTube is not. Um, they own my data, and when they want to shut it off, they can. And so, I mean, I think the larger question about the main of one's own, if it's really going to be interesting, is thinking about what the idea of maintaining data that you own and create. And it's not just data. It's not just X's and O's. It's personal. It's your thoughts. It's you know, your caress to others. How do you maintain and manage and take that with you? And, you know, we've been so willing to, you know, share crop on the master's land in their fields. And I, I just think that's really dangerous. So part of the main of one's own is thinking about those alternatives. It's not, look, it's not perfect. It's, it's got warts and all. You know, and it's going to be hard for people. Some people won't like it. Some people say, oh, I just want to use Tumblr or whatever. That's fine. I mean, I just, I mean, I'm not saying that's the end of the road, but I just don't, I just don't think as a culture we're really thinking about the implications you know, that are far and wide for people to own and maintain who they are in this digital space. And uh, 
I don't think it's just purely about this kind of, you know, capital sense of ownership. You know, it's also about this kind of strange notion of a fragmented continuity, if that makes any sense. I don't know. I mean, I just think it's a far deeper conversation than um, what we're having right now in ed tech. I mean, I don't maybe that's pompous to say, but I don't really think the education, the discussion in education is still moved much beyond the, the, the concept of tools, you know, and the concept of, hey, you know, this will be good for my class or, you know, I, I, I'm not a usually, I'm a very optimistic person, but when I think hard and long enough about it, um, we've been kind of going down this road for seven or eight years now, and I still get, you know, the reaction like, you're out of your mind. Like, why is this at all any different? It's like, if you've been on the web for the last 10 years and you don't, and you're not concerned about, you know, third-party services controlling and maintaining and owning your data and a real concept of who you are, I then, then that's just a kind of a fundamental ontological break between you and I. You know? I don't know. Jim, as a courtesy, we always finish on time. Uh, um, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to close this up now. I, I am intrigued by what sort of happened in the chat. And my sense is that there are, there are many of you in the chat who, who would still really like some kind of a, a more practical, pragmatic approach to this. And I will figure out how to do that. In the meantime, Jim, I really want to thank you because these are the questions that I'm really personally interested in. I think you've done a brilliant job of bringing them out, and I'm, you know, really appreciative of the, both the time and the thinking. Well, Steve, thank you, and everybody in the chat, I want to thank you. If I seem a little out of my mind tonight, uh, that's because I was. <laughs> you know who your intellectual uh, heritage belongs with? It's Richard Stallman. <laughs> yeah, no, right? I'm no. That guy actually is a thinker. I'm not. <laughs> No, but Thanks, there's so much, so much closer. Thanks to Jim. Thanks to all of you for attending. Thanks to everybody. We will find ways to keep this conversation going. Uh, I've put the links to the, to the listing of the new shows coming up on the whiteboard. Take care, everybody. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are. Bye now. Bye-bye.